with that, as we we are beginning to be a bit pressed for time, um, I, I would like to thank Dr. Zanders and to move on to our uh, next speakers. Uh, that will be a joint presentation to conclude the first session of our um, conference. And um, uh, with a great pleasure, um, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Michael Crowley and Professor Malcolm Danzo of the University of Bradford. So uh, very briefly about them, uh, uh, Dr. Michael Crowley is an honorary visiting uh, senior research fellow uh, at the Division of Peace Studies and International Development uh, of Bradford University. Uh, and he's also research associate for the Omega Research Foundation in the UK. He has worked for 25 years on arms control, security and human rights issues, including with Amnesty International, um, uh, BASIC. He's, he's been a coordinator of the Bradford non lethal Weapons Project and has also served as an executive director of uh, Vertec, uh, which is um, an NGO organization providing legal assistance to uh, countries in the uh, disarmament and non-proliferation arena. Um, he has previously acted as chairperson of the Bioweapons Prevention Project, and uh, he's trained um, in the regulation, or his PhD uh, essentially looks at the regulation of threat control agents and incapacitants, uh, and is originally trained in genetics. And uh, Professor Malcolm Danzo, who is originally trained as biologist as well, uh, is researching international security, uh, um, also at the University of Bradford at the Peace Studies Department with a focus on chemical and biological weapons, arms control, and, uh, and biosecurity. And he's an author and contributor to numerous books over the years, um, um, a lot of titles there. And uh, if you Google his name, there'll, there'll be a whole bibliography would come up. Uh, his most uh, recent research uh, includes um, uh, the revolution of life sciences and um, how that uh, can affect uh, established disarmament regimes, specifically in the area of chemical and uh, biological uh, disarmament. And he's been a contributor to different international projects and, uh, and initiatives, including in engaging civil society with issues of disarmament and security. Uh, so with a great pleasure, uh, Professor Dando and Dr. Crowley, the floor is yours. And um, uh, please, um, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Tatiana. And thanks to everybody for the invitation. As our keynote speaker mentioned, Michael and I have a book uh, which will be published uh, next week. And the title is Toxin and Bioregulator Weapons, Preventing the Misuse of the Chemical and Life Sciences. Our intention here is in the uh, next half an hour to give you an insight into what we were trying to do in this book and what we found. So could I have the next slide, please? The book starts with a paper which Julian Perry Robinson wrote in, what, a decade and a half ago, in which, as usual, he pointed out something very significant, that although the Chemical Weapons Convention and the Biological and Toxin Weapons Convention are supposed to overlap in the control of mid-spectrum agents, like toxins, bioregulators, malodorants, and so on. Uh, in the real world, it often appears as if the two treaties focus individually on their key topics, i.e. for the Chemical Weapons Convention, synthetic chemicals, and for the Biological and Toxin Weapons Convention, pathogens, and that the mid-spectrum agents fall into a gap between the two conventions. And this is particularly important because these agents are one of the areas where the erosion of the prohibition could so simply take place. So we were interested in this uh, publication by Julian. In fact, in 2015, we produced a research report for the University of Bath looking at one particular group of chemicals, pharmaceutical agents that attack the central nervous system. And it was our intention to very quickly move on to look at toxins and bioregulators more generally, but 
in the rush of events, we didn't manage to do it until we were both tied down by the pandemic, like everybody else, and we did have enough time to have a shot. So that is why we uh, were looking at these agents and how we came to be doing it. Next slide, please. Toxin and bioregulator weapons, preventing the misuse of chemical and life sciences, focuses on mid-spectrum agents. A broad view of these agents is taken, toxins, bioregulators, incapacitants, right control agents, malodorants, and their associated means of delivery. You, those of you who heard the keynote speech will see how what we were talking about maps very closely onto a lot of what Gunter was interested in. What we did in the original thing for the University of Bath was develop a framework to assess what activities within a state might be of a concern to other states. And we used that same framework here. We applied the framework to six country case studies and we circulated the results of our findings to the state parties before we went ahead and published so that they had some chance to respond to what we had found. Next slide, please. So the book is simply set out in an introduction, chapter one. Chapter two is looking at the impact of uh, research advances in the life and associated sciences on these particular types of chemicals. And then chapters three through eight consider case studies in China, India, Iran, Russia, Syria, and the United States. Chapter nine then has a broad look at the regulation of these toxins and bioregulators under international arms control and other disarmament in instruments. And finally, we come to conclusions and recommendations based on what we'd found and appendices which give the formal responses from at least five of the six states. We did try very, very hard to get a formal response from India, but we were unable to achieve it. Next slide, please. So what kind of factors might indicate research and development activities of con potential concern? We came up with four broad uh, factors. A, information related to policy and practice associated with the weaponization of toxins and bioregulators. B, information on research establishments and personnel. C, information on the actual research on toxins and bioregulators being done. And D, combinations of these indicators. So each of these uh, elements of the framework had subsections of questions within them. And I've set out in this slide under C, the kinds of subsections of questions that we had in that particular area. Next slide, please. So just in terms of um, chapter two on what's going on in the science and technology, basically we argue that the kinds of arguments made by Julian, Matt Mieselson, uh, Petro and his colleagues stand up in the sense that what we're getting is an ever more detailed understanding of the mechanisms which underlie the physiological systems of li living organisms. And we try to illustrate this at the end of chapter five, just by setting out how toxicologists have got to the state of being able to specify the different kinds of uh, toxins that they have found and the mechanisms by which those toxins operate. So for instance, superantigens, uh, SEB being an example, short circuit the immune system. Uh, AB type subunits crash cellular functions, for instance, botulinum toxins and venoms, 
turn out to be cocktails of components which act synergistically in different ways in order to produce particularly rapid action. So with that brief intro introduction, let me turn over to Michael, who will um, give you some detail on the kinds of things we found. Michael. Thanks, Malcolm. Um, and uh, hello, everybody. And uh, thank you very much uh, to Tatiana and the organizers uh, for inviting uh, the pair of us uh, to give this presentation. My, um, uh, what's the word? Uh, internet thing is, um, is up and down. So I'm gonna turn off my own video of myself because uh, that might help um, to ensure that we uh, remain in contact. Anyway, so um, next slide, please. Oops, there I go. Yeah, so I uh, briefly want to um, uh, give some illustrative examples of what we found. Uh, and basically, this is just part of, of what we found, but I'll look at, at the following um, six areas. Uh, outlined here. So uh, the difficulties around um, uh, dual use and uh, related to biodefense, um, then looking at um, the fact that uh, research of potential concern is not uh, related only to uh, traditional classic agents that have previously been investigated um, as potential uh, weapons, but um, also extends to uh, what you could call novel uh, toxins. Uh, then looking at uh, brain research projects uh, and cons potential concerns there. Uh, then uh, research around CNS acting chemicals, um, uh, then malodorants, uh, um, and finally, um, right control agents of biological um, origin or their synthetic an analogues and associated means of delivery. Next slide, uh, please. Thank you. So um, the country case studies, as I said, illustrate a, a wide range of dual, uh, dual use research and associated activities. Uh, including that undertaken by chemical and biological weapons defense establishments into uh, toxins, bioregulators, associated by regulatory pathways, physiological systems, uh, as, well as potential measures to facilitate and means of external extermination. And of course, the necessity of such defense work is recognized and specifically permitted when it's conducted or uh, protective purposes under the Chemical Weapons Convention or for prophylactic protection and other purposes under the BTWC. Uh, but even from, from the partial and incomplete information that's publicly available, there are indications that research undertaken in certain case study countries that we looked at um, in their CBW defense establishments may previously have come near or actually crossed the line into weapons development, and in particular with regard to so-called threat assessment um, activities. But due to uh, incomplete uh, publicly available information, the intention behind such research and uh, associated activities is sometimes difficult to determine. Um, uh, yeah, so um, even though, um, so we examined, so uh, we examined uh, contemporary published scientific papers and open source uh, information relating to the recent activities of defense establishments and associated biodefense research in, in the case study countries. And, and here's an example of, of what we found in one case study country. Um, uh, that you know is of potential concern. So, so in this country, we we found uh, research into the toxicity of aerosolized toxins, toxin movement across barriers, um, uh, um, activities around advanced engineering of botulinum toxins, staphylococcal toxins, super antigens function, the investigation of that, and the use of recombinant uh, technology in SEB production. And as I said. Um, this is looking at publicly available information, uh, both with regard to the specific activities of, of uh, defense research establishments, but also related research undertaken by, by uh, scientists associated uh, with them. And for this particular uh, country, even though, um, uh, 
yeah, even though uh, elements of this country, CBW's defense research establishment are, are classified, um, the lev um, it does provide um, a certain uh, information in the public domain. And for this country, the transparency and reporting, in fact, that it undertakes is far, far greater than many other BTWC uh, states parties, where there is very little uh, um, at all. Uh, next slide, please. OK, uh, so, you know, so that's uh, really a, a call to increase uh, transparency and reporting um, in this area. Um, as I said, oops, thank you. Um, boom, boom, boom. Right. Um, we believe that that um, the OBCW and the BTWC states parties uh, shouldn't restrict their concerns uh, with regard to the scope of toxins and bioregulators of potential concern only to those previously investigated uh, weapons agents, uh, ricin, ser, botulinum toxin, etc. In several uh, case study countries, uh, we found military and non-military institutions and scientists who have undertaken contemporary research, identifying, screening, and isolating novel toxins that had the potential for, for weaponization. And this included those derived from indigenous poisonous plants, um, amphibians, reptiles, scorpions, and, and marine animals. In some cases, the, the stated intent and associated activities were, were clearly medical. In others, the intent was unstated or unclear. And, and in certain um, cases, uh, the intention appeared to be for toxin weaponization. For example, scientists from, from one country's national defense research establishment published uh, a series of, of papers on their investigations of toxins derived from native stinging and, and poisonous plants. And for example, this is uh, um, elements from, from one paper that they published in 2018, where they specifically argued that because the BTWC ban, and, and the quotes are from their paper, uh, ban the use or stockpiling of most of the pathogenic biothreat agents, this will necessitate uh, a search for some novel natural biothreat agents from, from stinging plants that may be used as future bioweapons for self-defense purposes. And that the object of their study was to identify, characterize, and screen the potential of stinging plants on the basis of their secondary metabolite uh, contents uh, that may be used for the formulation of novel future bio threat agents for self-defense. Um, next slide, please. Thanks. And this is uh, another, um, uh, this is an extract from a, a second uh, paper. Um, so in this paper, uh, the scientists described their continuing investigations into plants that, quote, produce toxins that have the ability to adversely affect human health in a variety of ways, ranging from relatively mild allergic reactions to serious medical complications, including death. Um, and it also highlighted the identification of several poisonous plants that can be used for, quote, the development of novel multi-system targeted warfare agents for defensive purposes. Uh, next slide, please. And they uh, went into more detail, identifying 10 uh, candidate plants. Um, and they stated that such plants have, have a harmful effect on various biological systems, like uh, the nervous system, cardiac system, digestive, respiratory, dermal, et cetera, simultaneously. So th this research um, over a number of years and published in a number of papers is concerning. Uh, and it should be noted that that we we tried very 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 hard to to find out exactly what was going on, um, but this was the state that um, didn't reply to to all our uh, um, letters um, uh, over over uh, several months. So there's open questions here as to as to what is going on. Uh, next slide, please. Thanks. Uh, okay. 
All right. Um, so the other another area that we looked at were, were brain research projects. So over the past uh, two decades, the technologies available to, to neuroscientists have developed rapidly and made it increasingly possible to understand the neural circuits in the central nervous system that underlie our behavior and the roles played by bioregulators in such processes. And there's obvious uh, advantages of this work, for example, in helping people with brain dysfunctions and injuries. And this has led states to initiate large scale brain research projects over, over recent years. And this is obviously a good thing. In certain countries, uh, scientists uh, from uh, military medical institutions and, and other defense related facilities have become involved in, in much of this research. And we explored this in, in two of our country um, case studies. In, in one country, um, yeah, in one country, uh, we found research on neurological systems and associated bioregulators in a variety of simple animal models that has potential dual use uh, applicability, as, as shown here, some of the papers that we found. <clears throat> Oops. And. Yeah, but um, to understand more complex human behaviors and the mechanisms that produce them, work is needed uh, to be carried out uh, beyond the simple animal models. And so in this country, um, they've also uh, used uh, non-human primates um, like macaque mon monkeys as, as models. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, a 2006 lecture from one of this country's leading researchers in, in this area highlighted the goals of non-human primate research, which included into Alia studies of the cognitive functions using non-human primates as the animal models and to generation of genetically modified, including transgenic monkeys as animal models of human brain disorders and for basic neurobiology research. And um, uh, uh, more, more uh, uh, material um, uh, from this expert um, that, um, stated that the research seeks to explore uh, the neural basis of cognition, including how molecules and cells establish synaptic uh, contacts and generate neural circuit activities. Next slide, please. Um, and as I said, um, oops, oh, there we are, thanks. Um, they used uh, macaque monkeys um, uh, to make uh, it more uh, efficient. They actually um, uh, speeded up uh, the life cycle of, of these monkeys um, so that their models would, would uh, uh, that they could use generations of models uh, more quickly. And whilst the, the purported purposes of such research are benign, there are clear risks of malign application, potentially including to facilitate um, development of bioregulator weapons that could um, attack or, or subtly influence or subvert human cognition, feelings and actions. And again, there's a, a lack of the concerns arise because there's a lack of transparency about what is going on and, and also the fact that um, military institutions are involved in, in some of this research. So again, it's a call for, for more transparency in this area. Uh, next slide, please. Thanks. Uh, the next uh, um, area that we looked at um, is with regards to um, broadly um, uh, what could be called uh, less lethal weapons. So, so several of, of our case study countries, we found research, development, and, and in certain cases, purported, uh, sorry, use of purported less lethal weapons. And of course, that term is, is a flexible one uh, and is not uh, appropriate in, in certain instances. Um, uh, uh, um, yeah, and that's such um, um, activities uh, are with regard to less lethal weapons employing toxic chemicals of biological origin as well as their synth synthetic analogues. And one example is around incapacitating chemical agents, also called central nervous system acting chemical agents, which are a, a disparate group of, of toxic chemicals whose purported intended purpose as weapons is to cause prolonged but non-permanent disability or incapacitation. And they include central, uh, centrally 
acting agents, uh, producing loss of consciousness, sedation, hallucination, incoherence, paralysis, disorientation, and, and other such effects. And many putative agents have low safety margins and inappropriate doses cause serious, sometimes permanent health effects that may result in death. Chemicals of biological origin and their synthetic, synthetic analogues have been amongst the substances um, explored as um, such weapons. So we, um, we looked at uh, one of our uh, countries that we looked at under a different uh, previous political regime, uh, undertook research and attempted development of CNS acting weapons, employing both pharmaceutical chemicals and bioregulators. During the 1980s and 1990s, according to high level whistleblowers, it explored potential CNS acting bioregulatory bio uh, weapons, including uh, endorphins and enkephalins and other neuromodulating peptides potentially capable of altering human cognition and emotions. One whistleblower alleged that the mood altering possibilities of regulatory peptides were of particular interest to the internal security uh, forces. And it's unclear whether all such activities were terminated following the change in political system of that country. And consequently, in, in 2002, this country's security forces employed an aerosolized CNS acting pharmaceutical chemical weapon in a large scale anti-terrorist operation that tragically led to the deaths of over 120 of the hostages. And dual use research into pharmaceutical chemicals with potential CNS uh, weapons application has subsequently been reported in that country. And this country maintains that the law enforcement use of CNS acting weapons is not regulated by the CWC. And it rejects the legitimacy of last year's CWC Conference of State Parties understanding that law enforcement use of aerosolized CNS acting chemicals was prohibited under the convention. So that sort of swirl of potential activities and the stance of that uh, state with regards to, to uh, uh, the application of the CWC in this area is a cause of concern. Next slide, please. In another um, case study country that we looked at, the state owned, um, uh, some of the state uh, owned companies uh, developed CNS acting weapons for use against individuals rather than groups. And such weapons have been documented in the possession of that country's military in, in 2011. These CN acting, CNS acting chemicals have not been identified and it's unknown whether research or development of bioregulator CNS acting weapons has occurred. And this country has also rejected the legitimacy of last year's CSP understanding on, on CNS acting chemicals. So cause for concern and questions to be raised. Next slide, please. Thanks. Uh, the next range of, of substances and, and weapons that we looked at um, in our case study countries are malodorants. So these are disparate group of naturally occurring and synthesized chemicals affecting the human olfactory receptors and when employed as weapons, they're intended to elicit short term and temporary uh, physiological effects or behavioral responses. And candidate malodorants examined, as well as those utilized to date, typically elicit strong aversion or avoidance responses in those targeted, whilst um, physiological responses can include nausea and choking and gagging and, and vomiting. Uh, in one case study country that we looked at, the defense and uh, defense funded projects research and explore development of malodorants, uh, malodorant weapons, uh, apparently investigating both naturally occurring substances and synthetic chemicals. And the military also undertook or funded projects to develop a variety of delivery and, and uh, dispersal mechanisms. And this is an example of one of them. So from 2004, uh, there was a commercial company and military partnership in this country, which sought to develop a 155 millimeter malodorant artillery round, and the munition um, itself encased uh, uh, multiple submunitions, which were then released over the target area and fell to the ground on, on parachutes and dispersed their malodorant payloads as they fell. And it had a range of at least uh, uh, 20 kilometers. Uh, and covered uh, a minimum of 5,000 square meters. And the project uh, was finally suspended in, in 2008. Um, yeah, uh, next, yeah, next slide, please, sorry. 
And this, um, and in this country, uh, the, the same country, um, at least one commercial uh, company uh, has until recently promoted a malodorant uh, skunk weapon, it's, uh, uh, which, um, which it, it, it calls um, its product, uh, uh, for law enforcement uh, um, and uh, military forces as well. And that's uh, where they promote it to. Uh, the company has described it as an organic solution developed in conjunction with police forces of unnamed allied countries. And it can be sprayed over a large area using standard water cannon or launched in less lethal type munitions to achieve greater distance and in a combination effect. And the company has promoted uh, a range of attendant delivery systems, including 40 millimeter less lethal grenade uh, shown here, skid sprayer and a 50 gallon uh, tank that has a range of uh, over 60 feet and dispenses skunk at a rate of seven gallons per minute. Uh, and although there's been no use to date uh, of uh, this malodorant weapon in, this in that country, there has been repeated, well publicized, confirmed use by the military and the police forces of another state that we didn't include in our study. And such use has been in disputed circumstances and human rights organizations and the media have reported repeated excessive and wide area use of this skunk weapon. In some cases, uh, there've been claims that it has caused uh, deleterious health effects as well. Uh, next slide, please. Thanks. Uh, the last area that I want to look at briefly are, are riot control agents, uh, and they're defined under the Chemical Weapons Convention as chemicals not listed in a, in a schedule, which rapidly produce sensory irritation or disabling uh, effects, which disappear within a short time following termination of exposure. However, RCAs, uh, when employed in large amounts or in enclosed spaces, can cause serious, sometimes fatal health effects. RCAs um, that are commonly employed in law enforcement do include a number of substances of biological origin, notably the capsaicinoids uh, uh, and a further chemically synthesized analog, PARVA. And in a number of the case uh, study countries, we found evidence of a development by, by state entities or state owned companies or commercial companies of a, a range of what we've called wide area riot control agent means of delivery capable of disseminating um, riot control agents, potentially including RCAs of biological origin over large areas or extended uh, distances. Um, and uh, for example, in, in this case, at, um, in one uh, case study country, we found two commercial companies uh, that have for many years and currently continue to promote an indoor RCA dispersion, uh, dispersion uh, mechanism that will quote, provide critical force protection for personal and facilities by use of remotely deployed tear gas as a deterrent to control disturbances, uprisings and riots in any facility where protective security is required, uh, whether it be prisons, government buildings or embassies. And it's also been promoted for external area denial as well. And the basic unit uh, can operate and discharge up to 25 tear gas dispensers selectively. And in larger facilities, can use uh, they can use uh, control units and dispensers to accommodate their security needs. It says, um, uh, yeah, multiple units. Sorry. And as you can see, the marketing material indicates that you can use either CS or OC uh, dust in the system. Um, next slide, please. Another company in, in the same country that we looked at uh, developed and until 2016 promoted a, a powerful spray and fogging uh, device. Um, and in its um, marketing material, uh, next slide, please. It said that the standard non-toxic training smoke can be mixed with irritants, including OC or pepper, that upgrades the capabilities to include crowd control or civil unrest and then a variety of other uh, uh, purposes, but also urban warfare. Um, and the fogger could uh, release over 1,500 cubic feet of smoke uh, with a range of uh, greater than uh, 30 meters in one second. So it was quite a powerful um, uh, um, dispersal device. Okay, uh, in another country that we looked at, uh, next slide, please. Thanks. Um, there were reports in 2015 that the police um, in, in one state of that country had acquired 
uh, five unmanned aerial vehicles incorporating a pepper spray delivery mechanism. So the, uh, this UAV can reportedly carry two kilograms of unspecified pepper spray and can be flown uh, within a range of, of one kilometre uh, uh, radius. And the police chief um, um, interviewed said that they'd successfully test flown the UAVs and he explained they were intended for use in, in crowd control. Um, situations. Next slide, please. Um, the final uh, um, uh, example uh, that I'll show today is uh, uh, one of our case study countries. In 2018, uh, the police in that country acquired three foreign, foreign manufactured uh, water cannon vehicles, each containing two water spray devices capable of employing large quantities of water that can be mixed with an RCA or a dye and can target individuals or crowds up to 50 meters away. And the authorities reportedly confirmed that the RCA employed in this case was PAVA. And from 2000, uh, August 2018, there were repeated reports of police employing the water cannon firing water mixed with the blue dye and or PAVA against protesters in disputed circumstances. In 2021, this country also acquired two further water cannon, this time from a domestic manufacturer that again were capable of using water laced with parva. And in all the previous cases that, that I raised, the, the manufacturers specifically highlighted the capability of their delivery mechanisms to disperse OC, parva, or, or, or pepper spray. But in addition uh, to these examples, there are an increasing range of wide area um, RCA means of delivery that could potentially be utilized for delivering such agents. Uh, they include multi-barrel launchers, automatic grenade launchers, mortar rounds, um, large caliber munitions, helleborn dispensers and, and cluster munitions, which have all been promoted in the past. So this is clearly a, a broader area of potential concern that requires further attention by, by both the BTWC states parties and the OBCW. Uh, and with that, I'll hand back to, to Malcolm. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, next slide, please. So we don't want to keep you too long um, from your lunch, but just to say that obviously the amount of information we generated was, was very large and very diverse. So the final chapter 10, first of all, summarizes the findings for each of the case study countries, and then tries to systematize our understanding of that mass of material by picking out certain overarching themes. Now, as you can see here, one overarching theme was the revolutionary changes taking place in the science and technology, particularly the shift from weaponeers looking at potential agents to looking at potential targets for multiple agents. But also what you could see in the information we had was how many more difficulties there were for state parties to really understand and be sure about what was going on in, in other countries. So a, a lot of um, concerns that the ambiguities and structural weaknesses in the conventions need to be addressed in the way that Jean Pascal was talking about earlier on. Um, then a whole set of issues about what the scientific community itself should be doing and whether there's a lot more that we should be expecting of the scientific community in understanding these dangers and putting some weight behind trying to deal with them. And particularly you then run into the, the problem of defence countermeasures and the complexities of trying to understand how to regulate dual-use research. Finally, just to reaffirm that Julian's supposition that there was a regulatory gap between the CWC and the BTWC does seem to be amply confirmed by the um, findings that we have. Last slide, please. So we end up with a set of recommendations, which I'm not going to drag you through at this stage, but just to say that the three groups were, first of all, what individual state parties might be able to do, 
and then what collective measures might be possible under the CWC and BTWC. And then particularly from my point of view, actions that might be taken under the chemical and life sciences and associated scientific communities to try to build up uh, a cultural responsibility and means of um, guidance and dealing better with the security implications of the advances that are being generated. Thanks very much. Thank you very much for the uh, very comprehensive and insightful talk to both Dr. Crowley and Professor Dando. Um, and um, as uh, we do understand that we are, uh, it's not good to stand between uh, people and their lunch break. Uh, we have a little bit of time for a couple of uh, short questions. Um, I'm just checking in the um, question and answer panel. At the moment, there are none. I would like to encourage you to have any burning questions or comments to please, please leave them here. Uh, and in the meantime, I would once again take advantage of my privilege of being a moderator today. And I'll ask um, uh, one or it, it's one question, but it, it, to some extent it has two parts. Uh, so um, my question is, uh, you mentioned in, in your talk several times the scope for enhanced transparency. And uh, my question would be more on the practical side, how we can actually, how, how, this, trans, how this enhanced level of term transparency could be achieved uh, in the field of uh, both the Biological and Toxin Weapons Convention and the Chemical Weapons Convention, um, how, uh, for instance, and in very practical, very practical step, how could states exchange information more effectively or more efficiently? Because at the moment, I think that the CBMs, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that the CBMs, for instance, the confidence building measures within the under the PTWC, they are not entirely suited for, for that purpose to cover that that type of research in a, such a greater detail. Uh, of course, under the Chemical Weapons Convention, there is the Scientific Advisory Board. Uh, but what other, what mechanisms could be leveraged or could be put in place to enhance transparency? And the second part of that question is, how do we, how, what actions or what steps are available to deal with the challenge posed by those states that uh, are reluctant to, um, once again, be held accountable for actions that have already been shown that are, uh, if not violation, then a clear, very gray area of the existing uh, provisions of, uh, um, in this case, the Chemical uh, Weapons Convention, and um, how uh, what, what actions are available to hold this such countries to account, and also to enhance transparency with with them to share because. There might be mechanisms to share information, but how can we guarantee that such countries would actually participate effectively in those, those kind of mechanisms? And wouldn't that create a problem for countries that are more keen to share what exactly is doing and how they are transparent vis-a-vis -vis those who anyway would um, be reluctant to participate and share information and be... Um, in a way, constructive and uh, reliable partners within the international um, arena. And I apologize for this being a quite quite a mixed up in terms of in terms of questions. And I'm happy to clarify a little bit. But uh, I would like to. Uh, well, cool. Over you let, to you. I was going to say I'll let Malcolm have a first stab at that. Well, I'll have a first stab at the second part, if that's okay, Mike. Um, I, I think the one of the ways that we have to go forward is by really working hard with the scientific community. And I'd see, for instance, enormous benefits from the development of the Tianjin guidelines for uh, codes of conduct for live scientists to complement what's already being done in the um, under the Chemical Weapons Convention um, with the Hague Ethical Guidelines. 
And I, I, I think we can take a sort of less confrontational approach to this by just trying to make sure that the Tianjin guidelines are approved and implemented in the next uh, intersessional process. And that we, we back that up by effective uh, biosecurity education for um, life scientists. And this then will open up many more people who have an interest and an understanding of what needs to be done. And in the, the longer term, I, I would hope to see something like the International Nuclear Security Education Network mirrored in an international biosecurity education network. So that around the country, around the world, different um, countries uh, could be contributing to developing the, the kind of uh, education processes uh, for life scientists that we've seen in places such as Japan and Ukraine very sort of systematic attempts to improve the security level of education and therefore uh, interest amongst the scientific community. Mike, do you want to have a go? Yeah, on? yeah. I've, um, again, it's a bit uh, disorganised, so apologies for that because it's quite a, 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 um, a complex question. Um, I th well, I think the, the, the first thing is that... Uh, you know, it is the responsibility of, and it, of course it would be beneficial if all those states where there's been either past or, or contemporary activities that are apparently related to development or, 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 or the utilization of toxins and bioregulatory weapons or, or mid-spectrum agents more broadly, you know, where they've been reported, where they've come into the, the public domain, that those, you know, it, it, the emphasis is on it, those states to, to provide clarification as, as to the nature and, and, and the purpose of, of, of such activities um, through uh, an, an appropriate mechanism of the BTWC or, or uh, the CWC control regime. So, you know, for in a number of cases, there may be, you know, uh, misperception about what's going on. And because uh, things are overly, uh, um, vague or you know not transparent enough then then these misperceptions can arise and in some cases misperceptions can can be very dangerous and and erodes the credibility of of the btwc and and the cwc so you know the onus is on the, those states where uh, uh there are concerns uh, and they've come into the public domain to to clarify uh, um those concerns and you know there are mechanisms for example, in the CWC, uh, um, and, uh, there are Article uh, uh, Ten uh, declarations. So, if you know, uh, if states are conducting uh, research into toxins and bioregulators for protective purposes, as they are fully entitled to do un under the convention, to adequately report uh, these activities in full to the MCW. Technical Secretariat and by you know a, a, and the states parties. Um, it's difficult for civil society to to know the extent of existing reporting uh, and the the uh, efficacy of such reporting because those uh, declarations are, are are not made public. See uh, under the BTWC. Um, Although they are voluntary uh, CBW uh, uh, CBM uh, measures, a number of states have made them uh, public, and such transparency measures, you know, are, are, should be encouraged. And um, also, and I think Malcolm can speak more to this with regards to improving the the CBM uh, reporting system uh, in the BTWC context. You know, there's a lot that can be done, and there needs to be an overhaul, I would say, of the whole system, perhaps incorporating some form of peer review process to assess and improve the, the quality of information that are provided by states in their annual reports. Um, and, you know, I'd say that, yes, yeah, such improvements in, in state information sharing 
in terms of the BTWC context, you know, could be coupled with far greater transparency um, and, and accountability to civil society. Uh, and again, you know, a number of states, including some of the states that, that we uh, looked at um, in our case studies, do provide uh, uh, varying degrees of information about their activities and allow their scientists to publish in the public domain, you know, and all that is to the good. And, and you know, we need to encourage uh, all the states' parties um, to do that. Uh, I would also say that there's an onus on, on states uh, the other states' parties to 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 both conventions to uh, use the appropriate um, um, clarificatory uh, mechanisms to where they do have concerns to to voice their concerns and and use the systems that both uh, um, uh, conventions uh, provide to. Uh, to clarify what really is going on. And of course, you know, as we've seen recently, there can be abuse of, of such um, clarificatory systems. But where a state does have a valid concern, does have um, evidence, uh, then again, for the sake of the um, faith in uh, the both regimes, um, those states should uh, use the appropriate systems to to clarify uh, what really is going on in another state of concern. Thank you. Thank you so much to both of you for being able to sort of pitch that, well, essentially partition the question and tackle it. Because uh, um, I think that it, it was it was posed in a very very the most complicated manner possible, and I do apologize for that. And I think that. The main takeaway message really is that really is the responsibility of, of states and to ensure good governance and ensure that they are in compliance and that they are as transparent as possible and to ensure their effective participation in those those measures uh, and the, the existing measures and the existing uh, regulations that in that in have in place and no one can take take away that that responsibility and it's the first and foremost that that responsibility that is there. Um, and there is one quick question um, also from our panel. Um, so any recommendations, do you have any recommendations for strengthening collaboration between uh, developed and middle income countries? Um, I suppose that, that that concerns also uh, exchange of information uh, would relate to uh, uh, emerging technologies, uh, scientific advances, uh, but probably also in the security sector and cooperation. So. Um, over to um, either or both of you. <laughs> Malcolm, do you want to try and do that one? Not sure if Sorry. Oh. Okay. Um, I, I just think that one fundamental thing that needs to be agreed in the review conference next week is that we have a much more serious and systematic um, mechanism for the review of science and technology within the Biological and Toxin Weapons Convention. And that will necessarily in, increase the need for that kind of cooperation between states in, in different levels uh, and with different concerns. And just on that particular point, I think it's important that we all look very carefully at the results of the temporary working group of the SAB on toxins when that comes out, I think next year, and see what implications that has for our understanding uh, of what is necessary to do in this particular area. Oh, one final thing that I wanted to to say as well, um, and it regards uh, coordination, collaboration. Uh, basically, I, I think um, what needs you know to happen would, although there are existing uh, levels of um, information exchange and cooperation and, and some collaboration over joint areas of concern um, between the OCW uh, 
technical secretariat and the BTCW, BTCW uh, implementation support unit um, and the relevant state, you know, and states parties, you know, they, these could be and should be uh, increased uh, and enhanced, uh, particularly, you know, with regards to regulation of toxins and bioregulators. Um, and and uh, particularly um, in light of the implications of of the growing convergence of of chemical um, and life sciences. So you know, as uh, we've got the BTWC review conference happening next week, you've got the um, the conference of states parties, the CWC happening next week, and then later next year the review conference of the CWC. You know, all these are really really good opportunities for. The two organisations to to look for synergistic uh, um, ways that they can work together more effectively in this area of overlap. Thank you.